Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank you for being so humble and nice. <laughs> Considerate to come out here and listen to what I have to say. But what I have to say is mine. It was never mine. It's ours. I never believed that I would find myself in front of an audience having to talk about a subject that we all once knew. A subject that is as old as creation. And if you want to see what I'm talking about, we have to just take a look at the zoo. The zookeeper doesn't feed the gorilla the food of the polar bear. Am I right? So how come we eat the food of everybody? We'll begin this lecture by letting you know, first of all, I'm your brother. No more, no less than you. I can't be smarter than you. That's impossible. We have the same amount of brain cells. So how was I privileged to be navigated to this information? I don't know. I don't even question myself. I just like to live. As a little boy, I hated school. That is the truth. I didn't go to school. I didn't like school. I didn't like to comb my hair. I didn't like a whole lot of things. I didn't like money. I was 12 years of age, I was Seventh-day Adventist. Corby Brown, we left that afternoon from the church. It was the 13th Sabbath. I said, Corby, how did you like the lecture? I didn't. <laughs> I said, why you didn't, Corby? Because they talk about Solomon. I want money. I say, Kirby, but when you have wisdom, you have everything. Well, I don't know what wisdom is now, nor then, but I knew that money was not my pursuit. Kirby said, I want money. We were 12 years of age, 1945. I'm 73 years of age now. In 1994, a young man by the name of Tom Flowers came to me and said, guess who is coming tomorrow? I said, who? Kirby Brown. I said, well, if I remember correctly, Kirby said when we were 12 that he wanted money. I hope he made millions of dollars. I don't have any millions. I don't even have a thousand dollars. But you don't. But that's okay. I live. I found that avenue, or it was shown to me, how to live. Not to read books. Because everybody reads books. But yet, society is deteriorating more every day. Everybody reads books. The brother called the other day on the radio and said that, he asked about corn, right? Corn? He read books. He said that the text, the Kemetic text showed him that corn is good. Well, he better examine his text because corn was made by man. But anyway, Kirby said he wanted money. That was a Thursday. Tom Prowler said, Kirby is coming tomorrow. So I said, well, if Kirby didn't make his millions, I'm going to remind him that we are alive. We are alive. Kirby didn't arrive. Kirby would never arrive. They had to take axe to chop the hotel door down. Kirby died of a heart attack. Kirby weighed 390 pounds. 
Kirby wanted money. He became a cop driver in New York. I didn't want any money. I didn't want it then or now. Because it's not important in your life. It was never important in our lives. The Maya shows that. The Maya built pyramids. The Maya lived for millions of years in the jungles of Central America. No money. The Africans. How long did we live in Africa without money? Since creation. Now they tell us we need money to fight AIDS. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we are at a deficit, a tremendous deficit, a deficit that if we do not pay attention, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did because I remain that obedient boy, that obedient boy that just lost his mama four days ago. I listen. I listen. But to listen, you can't have a philosophy in your head. If you have a philosophy in your head, you cannot listen to anyone. I was there. I was a Seventh-day Adventist. I listened to no one but those things that came from the church. Well, if I were to listen to the church today, the Seventh-day Adventist, I'd be eating tofu. I'd be sick. You see? I'd be eating tofu. If I had gone to school, I would have become a medical scientist. I wouldn't have been able to cure AIDS because they do not. They don't cure AIDS. If I had listened to all of the philosophies of Europe, I would have never been able to find the answer to the cure of diseases. But today, I'm going to share with you the African wisdom, the African brain, the African genesis, the African resonance, something that was never taught to us in the schools. Well, why should we expect the school to teach us something that would enhance our growth and save our lives? Why should the school teach you that? When in history, has there ever been examples to show that one race of people is indebted to another? That has never been. Then you tell me that the white man is a bigot. The white man was never a bigot. He was never a discriminator. The white man is a person that obeys the first law of nature. Self-preservation is the first law of nature. So the white man, whenever he proceeds to preserve his race, and we sit back and say, he's a bigot, it's only because we have lost it, and we don't even know how to get ourselves out of this mess. I'm one of them. I'm you standing here. But one day, it was to be that your brother would be shown something that would change the profile of things. I left my country where I was born then. In 1953 to New Orleans, I became a merchant seaman. I was 20 years of age. As a merchant seaman, I became an engineer five years later. I'm a steam engineer. Don't ask me how I did that because that's going to baffle you because I've never been to school, and I don't read books. I don't read books now, nobody's book. I'm not even going to read my own. <laughs> because all the book readers come to me asking me, how did you cure AIDS? But that's, that's like asking the gorilla, hey man, how come you keep yourself healthy without a hospital? How come you don't have any medicines? We'll begin. I became a merchant seaman right quick to take you through my life. Left Honduras without going to school, became a merchant seaman, became an engineer, worked for the Count of Los Angeles as an engineer. Why as an engineer, the Count of Los Angeles, 
something is to happen. Something is to change my life completely. First, it was a Mexican. The Mexican said to me, you're dying. I said, I know. How do you know? Because I fell out going to the bathroom on Sunday afternoon, and I didn't reach the bathroom. I got up off the floor. Something must have happened between there and the bathroom. But I had gone to the neurologist, the endocrinologist, the GIR practitioner in Russia, in England, in Germany, in France, United States. And there were people that knows what it is about. They had the great big books on medical science. But my asthma and my diabetes, my impotence was kicking. What happened to the books? They read books. All the physicians that treated this boy read books of all kinds. Nothing happened. I go to Mexico, and the Mexican have a goat in his house. Every five words, it was bad. <laughs> bad. And I'm looking around. The Mexican said, the goat bothering you? I said, no. <laughs> You're dying because you are disobedient. Then you brought the Holy Bible. Honor thy mother and thy father that thy days may be long upon the land. That's in the Bible, isn't it? But how could we honor our mother and our fathers when we don't even know what they were about? You don't tell that to an elephant to honor his mother because when he's born, he follows his mother and watch what his mother eats. Do you and I know what our mothers ate in Africa? We don't know, yet we dialogue. We dialogue on this level of intelligence because I know Plato, I know Aristotle, I know all about Diogenes, but you don't know what your mama ate. <laughs> so everything that you talk about means absolutely nothing. So you see, you see where they have us at a deficit? That's why we need each other. Now I became an engineer, the Mexican said, stop eating. Don't eat anything. For how long? Three months. I said, are you crazy? He said, no, you nuts. <laughs> you ask me if I'm crazy. You've been eating garbage for 30 years. You've been eating garbage. And I'm going to remove the garbage for 90 days and you ask me if I'm crazy. <laughs> what was I eating? Hog maws, chitlin, neck bones, crackling bread, lawn in New Orleans. Eggs, because the grown-ups told me when my penis wasn't getting hard, eat eggs. <laughs> Drink raw eggs. And I did, by the dozens. <laughs> and nothing happened. The Mexicans said, don't worry about it, don't eat. 90 days later, I was no longer impotent, no longer diabetic, no longer asthmatic, no longer with glasses on my eyes, and this tumor hair was 42. What happened to the science that the physician were using? Medical science. It didn't work, isn't it? But it worked with me. The herbs work with me. This Bible says. In the book of Revelation, it says 22 verse, and the first chapter, it talks about the herbs for medicine. Am I right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what could have happened to us that when my brother, who was a preacher for 30 years, went, was sick, and instead of going to God's medicine, he went to the physician to get a chemical in his arm. My brother died 21 years ago. I'm not a preacher. I would never be a preacher. I told that to my mother. She wanted me to be the preacher. I said, no, 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 no. That would be the last thing that I would consider. She said, why? I said, because I want to live truth. Even if it kills me, I'm going to live truth. And truth is, the Bible says that the herbs are for the healing of the nations. 
But the preacher, when he gets sick, he will get a chemical. What is the message he's sending to God? Come on, just be fruitful. Let us be truthful today. If never again in our life, let us be that today. Why do we go to see the doctor to give us a chemical when the Bible says the herbs are for the healing? Why do we go? Well, you're going to soon find out. That's what affected me then and probably affecting me now to a great degree. More than I would ever realize. Because remember, I want to go to the blackboard. Roughly speaking, Africa. Way over here, we put America. They are 4,500 miles. What happened between hair and hair? A lot happened. You see, when we were hair, without the mathematics, without the ABC, without the sciences. When we were hair, we had something to our advantage that we no longer have hair. We are blind hair. Hair we weren't. We were seeing. Why? Because God provided us with everything we needed here. And none of it was comfrey or rice and beans. There were no tofu. There were no soy there. There were no cows. And there were no hogs, no chicken. There were no flour. Those things didn't come from Africa. You see rice and beans and flour and cheese and meat and the starch that you eat, they all came from right here, from a laboratory. Now, for us to eat, you have to have in your big skull the understanding of biochemistry. But when we were here, we didn't have to know anything about biochemistry. Why? Because God doesn't make poisons. You see, God doesn't make carrots. Well, let me put it here. Stop the garbage. Anytime someone tells you that tofu is good for you, that someone that just gave that information to you, has one eye open, but he's confident that when he tells you to eat carrots and you drink it, you have both clothes. So a one-eyed man is king where everybody's blind, but the one that recommends the tofu is only half seeing. He's blind. He got one eye open only, but he doesn't know it. Example. Before we get into the real lecture, pull this out. This is how people take privileges on us. They don't care about us. They bring us information that, oh God, that's why the rest of the world laugh at us. Because they know that we have both eye closed. Here it is. Uh, Moringa. Moringa has... 23 times the iron in spinach. Spinach has iron? No, because spinach, let me take my time because there's a whole lot of information. I don't want to jog it up. Anything that has a pH of 7 plus is alkali. Anything that has less, five, four, three, two, one, is acid. Spinach. Acid. Why compare Moringa with spinach? When spinach has a starch base, it has no iron. 
seven times the calcium in milk. Milk has calcium. Well, I stopped drinking milk 42 years ago. And I could fall on my knees. You drink milk with Moringa, because it said to mix it with making some pages hair, you're not going to fall on your knees at 73. You, you're going to leave your knees down there. <laughs> 11 times vitamin A that you find in, car in, in carrots. Carrots has vitamin A? Carrots belongs on the acid side of life. So right there, and they send it to mix with carrot juice. Why would they do that? Then up here, they talk about the Ayurvedic system of medicine, recommends Moringa. The Ayurvedic is Indian. The Ayurvedic system of medicine recommends cow milk. The Ayurvedic system of medicine has never cured any disease, no Moringa, nor any other system in the world. You know what, what this is like? When Steven Seagal tells me to come to his house because he had a headache for five years. Well, I knew why the headache was in his head. It was removing less than 10 minutes. He had the bottle and said, this bottle is powerful. I said, yeah, powerful, huh? So yeah, the headache is gone. You know, he's a Dalai Lama, right? He wanted me to go to Kathmandu. Kathmandu? I'm going to go to Kathmandu. To do what? Talk to Lamas. Lamas for what? Where am I going to talk to Lamas for? They couldn't cure your headache that you had for five years. The Lamas need to come and see me. Not me, the Lama. But since we were compromised, we left all our food in Africa. You and I don't even know what we ate in Africa. So don't even go there. But we have the opportunity because one of your brothers happened not to go to school and look outside of the paradigm of school and found something altogether different. And what did I find? That anything that God made is on the alkali side. Why? The molecular structure is complete. It was made by nature, not man. Anything that God made has no starch. That's another thing. Anything that nature makes has no starch. Anything that man made has to have starch because starch is a binder. To titrate two unequal chemicals, you have to use a starch. Starch is not a food. Starch is a chemical. And what have we been eating since they took us away from Africa? Starch and blood. Starch and blood. We didn't eat blood in Africa. Gorilla doesn't eat blood. He leaves and buries. <laughs> but gorillas are sane. They listen to each other and they have a society well put together. Well, Sebi, when he became the engineer, and he found out that the pH value of things had a lot to do with healing and the properties that's to be used. I was happy. I, was I used to run home. Ma, -ah. guess what I found? I found that the herb that everybody's talking about is acid and everybody's using it. What herb is that? Come free. To say what? I said, yes, it's on the acid side. And so is rose hips. Enchilesia. What about golden seal? That's right, golden seal was made. It's like the stick that you put in your mouth. They call what? What do they call it? The chew stick. What do they call it? Liquid stick. Everybody have liquid stick in their mouth, right? But liquid stick was made. It has 50 times more sugar 
than does sugar itself. It has glycerinic acid. You see, we didn't have to study biochemistry in Africa because everything we had there was on the alkali side. So we could eat anything. But when they brought us here, mm hmm. You know, put some clothes on now. <laughs> and after they put the clothes on you, come here, boy. You got to get in front of this classroom. You have to learn this ABC stuff. But hold it now. Gorillas doesn't take their cubs to be trained by polar bears. <laughs> gorillas train her own cubs. The gorilla way. But no. You and I, our parents couldn't do better. They had to take us to the school because they wanted to save us. You know, protect us, because that's mother. Mother doesn't want child to suffer. So mother was shown that if child didn't go to school, and they'd be illiterate, and the society's made up where you must go to school, if you want to buy a Mercedes. <laughs> but in our society, school, what, what you mean by school? We don't have such animal. We build things. And those who've been to school, can't even build the pyramids today. Not in Honduras, not to mention the pyramids in Mexico. They're full time to start their pyramids in Egypt. Uh -oh. oh, yes. I know Ben joking and didn't talk about that. But that's okay. Because he need help like I need help. We all need help. So the school that we thought was going to be so equitable, so useful, has become a deterrent. Because those that have been to school doesn't cure anything. How did I learn and I didn't go to school? Easy. You know, we baby as kids, we don't die. <laughs> right? We do it. I'm not wiser than you. I may be more mischievous than you. <laughs> I know that because I do some mischievousness that you would not believe. But anyway, as an engineer, I went to work one night and I began to test herbs. And I begin to see that all the herbs that you guys are using are acid, every single last one of them, except for burdock, yellow dock. They're natural herbs. And the other one, which is the uh, red clover, that's a natural herb. You know, they're alkali, they're very good. So I begin by compounding herbs from all over the world. And lo and behold, a blind man was killed named Mr. Fredericks. Then, the Japanese, Fred Takashi, his wife was killed of endometriosis. She had a baby. She was never supposed to have a baby. She's a white lady from Utah. My boss brought his daughter and his brother with ulcers. They were killed. The boss came to me one afternoon and said, so you're going to leave me? I said, yep. He said, you're going to leave me? On your resume, you said that you didn't go to school. And the only reason why I hired you is that I was curious to find out how could a man have an engineer license never been to school? <laughs> I wanted you to fail. But instead, you did something that is extraordinary. Are all black people like you? I say, Brett Howell, your name is Brett Howell. Are all black people like me? I say, I'm the dumbest. <laughs> Yes, they're all like me and more powerful than me. But how come they're not doing what you're doing? You killed the blind man. You killed my daughter of ulcers. Could they do that? I said, they could do it better than you, than me. But why aren't they doing it? Because they're afraid of you. I'm not afraid of God. I'm not afraid of the devil. <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything, especially you. Because I don't live in fear. <laughs> <laughs> I say, Brad Howell, the black man of America is afraid of you white people because you guys made him afraid of you. And you should not feel good about that. It's not about me hating white people, loving white people, loving black or hating black. It's about understanding. Nobody's going to help us but us. Nobody in this world, whether white, black, Chinese, or Arab, could help us. 
is impossible for them to help us. Why? Because they don't know us. They're not of our genetic or predisposition. Look, as a Christian, I used to eat pork. <laughs> of course I eat pork, and I love it. But as a Muslim, I eat lamb, which is ten times worse than pork. <laughs> so, so what do I do? Who do I turn to? So, after I quit my job, the boss said, wait just a minute, because I think you're crazy. <laughs> you're leaving your job as a steam engineer in 1980, when herbs in 1980, I'm making $2,900 a month. I'm going to leave my job with 10 years seniority to come after some herb that you didn't like. Why did I do this? I had to do it. It wasn't that I could see that far. I can't see beyond my nose. Talk about years ahead. But I had to quit my job. And I had to question myself, why am I doing this? But I did. And 1980, the boss is looking at TV, 1987, on the 10th day of February, and he see CNN. Alfredo Bowman, a.k.a. Dr. Sebi, is arrested for practicing medicine without a license. Selling partner approved by the FDA and claiming to cure AIDS and other diseases, which is a fraudulent claim. The boss saw that. The boss wife is in the bathroom because he told me the story himself. He called her out, come and see the man that's arrested. If he says he cure AIDS, I know he cure AIDS because Brad Howard knew that I would never compromise myself to a lie. When I talk, I know what I said is the truth. But I also know that in America, you could also be dead right. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It does not matter. I'm 73 already. They killed me tomorrow. It's all over with. I rarely reached 73. My brother, who was a preacher, he only got to 50. But I stuck with you, the black woman. That was my success. You, the black woman. I always kept my eyes on you. Nobody else. Not the maid, because I'm one. We don't do nothing. We can't do anything. We need you. Because it is you that held a hand, it is you that breastfed us. My mother breastfed me for only four years, but that was sufficient. <laughs> in 1962, two statements was made in a barber shop. 1640 Claiborne Avenue, New Orleans, Louisiana. Tim Timothy Barbershop. Tim Barbershop. Ernest Moriel. Walking there when he was a lawyer. And every time Ernest came in the barbershop, we used to jump on Moriel. I mean, we used to kick him around the place. Moriel said, you see you niggas? One day, I'm going to become mayor. And I'm going to remember you, Alfredo. That's me. The big mouth. I'm going to have you in jail. Ernest became the mayor of New Orleans. I was in Los Angeles. And the most hurting thing in my life was when I heard that Moriel had passed with asthma, a disease that I used to suffer with, that I was cured of in Mexico, and that I have addressed so many times, Moriel died. Honest Moriel. Then another statement was made by me in that same barbershop. I said that I would give the black woman a gift. Brother said, Logan said, Sapphire? I said, yes, yeah, Sapphire, your mama. <laughs> I said, she was the first, she, you came out of her, she held your hand, she teach you everything about the basic things of life, and then she cut you loose. Now she worth nothing, she's Sapphire. I'm going to give her a gift. 1962, that statement was made. But 1962, I was sick. I had asthma, I had diabetes, I was impotent, I had everything under the sun. 
But in 1964, I was killed, and years went by. Then I found out this is the gift to the black woman. The healing that I found is in your hands now, black woman. Yes, it's in your hands. So in 1987, I was arrested. And while I was in jail, I was the happiest man in the world. Because when I was 40 years of age, I was going to work, and I passed by Miss Louise Wright House on my right, and I made a statement, I'm going to help humanity. And here it is. 1987 is the showdown. I was arrested. All of the people in New York that were healers, I don't need to call their name. They said, yeah. They got the big mouth. They were angry at me because I put an ad in the Village Voice and the Amsterdam News and the New York Post. AIDS has been cured by the USHA Research Institute. And we specialize in cures for leukemia, sickle cell, impotent blindness, cancer, and others. Well, I, after all, I did it. Shouldn't I advertise it? <laughs> you should be glad your, your brother's doing that. Because now you have a chance to share in the bounty, right? That's the way I felt. So I'm in jail and I'm wondering, how is the American Medical Association going to escape from this one? You see, in the past, herbalists, when they talk, shh, got to be quiet. Got to talk under the table because the physician may get you. The FDA going to get you. But we seem to forget the one basic thing. When they remove us from Africa, did they bring our food with us? Did they? No. Well, how could the FDA have such kind of power over us now? Come on now, just wake up to it. So I stood in jail thinking, how am I going to do this one? <laughs> this is going to be a heavy number, but it's nice because... I wanted this moment. I wasn't going to back down. What you mean, back down? I'm representing some black woman. I never had a father. I never had a man in my, in, in my confines to tell me something. No, I never had a stepdaddy. I had a woman. And then another woman, my grandmother. My great-great-grandmother lived to 124. Her name was Elizabeth, and she lived 70 years without a man. My great-grandmother lived 112. She lived 68 years without a man. My grandmother died at 100, and she lived 50 years without a man. My mother died five days ago, and she racked up 40. My mother died while I was coming to see you. I didn't turn back. You know why? The relationship with me and my mother was one of love. And she would have never wanted me to be there. My brother told my mother when I was about 10 years ago, he told her, yeah, you didn't like me. You didn't give me any love. You didn't give her any love either. That's me. So my mother said, what you say? You gave all your love to the pastor, not to Fred and me. My mother said, uh, like, Fred, are you in on that? I say, ma'am, this boy was talking garbage. <laughs> See, he told me he's serious. I'm never serious. I don't know what it is to be serious. I hear men talk about seriousness. Well, I don't know what you do with that. But she, my mama said, raise your hand up and open your fingers. Which finger would you elect to take off of your hand? I say, none. She said, thank you. My mother turned to my brother and said, you said that I didn't give Fred any love. Fred, you wanted my love? I said, nope. <laughs> didn't want it. I didn't need it. Because my mother knew if my mother ever interfered in my life, I've been upset. I was in the streets by the river all the time. My mother, know, all mother knows the child that needs her love, her attention. But she loved all. But she knows the one that needs the attention. I didn't want my mother attention. <laughs> <laughs> and she knew it. But my brother said that she didn't give him any. But the boy went to the third grade. 
He owns a fishing fleet. He owns an ice factory. And he owns a fleet of planes. And he said that his mother didn't give him love. You see how we could easily make mistakes. Okay. Mother is mother and will always be mothers. The greatest gender on the planet. So while I'm going to court now, and I'm standing, the judge said, get the man out of jail, and I went to his chambers. Judge Charter said, young man, you mind if I ask you a question? I said, no, sir. Why did you advertise that you cure AIDS? Mm. Well, sir, my mother's alive. Africa exists, and my face, and I would never offend any of the three. That's why I advertise that I cure AIDS. He turned to the woman at the desk and said to her, ask her, did you investigate this man before you arrest him? She said, no, her name was Phyllis Pay from the attorney general office in New York. She said, no, you didn't investigate this man before you arrest him. This man, the response he gave me, he cured AIDS. But AIDS is the easiest thing to cure. People think that AIDS is difficult. To me, everything is easy, and to you it should be too. And I'm gonna show you why it's so easy. So the judge said, well, uh, you're out in bail. And you, that was February the 12th, I got out of the 13th. But the case doesn't begin until 88. September, I have a year and eight months. Why the judge gave me so much time, I would never understand. So I waited, trial date. This is where the showdown with black and white. Not better or worse. We are not better than any white man or Chinese, no. We just happen to be different. That difference has never been treated by any religion or philosophy. There is a difference that needs to be understood. So while I went into court, the judge said, well, Dr. Sebi, will you please begin? Mm, where do I begin? Begin where you say you cure AIDS, and the physicians say there's no cure. Ah, the physicians are 100% right. There is no cure for AIDS or any other disease. The judge said, just a minute. There's <laughs> a contradiction here. Yeah? The newspaper says that you cure AIDS. Then you agree with the physicians. That's a contradiction. No, it's not. When you're limited, it is. But when you leave out the box, it isn't. She said, help me. She said, of course. The physician take the position that there is no cure for AIDS or any other disease, and the physician are 100% right, according to their philosophy and their perspective. Their medicine didn't show them a cure. So how could they say that there is a cure? But the perspective that prepared me there is cure for AIDS and every other disease. Oh my God, when I said that, the physician jumped up. Your Honor, Dr. Victor Herbert said, Your Honor, what other perspective could there be? After all, you know, this patent on us, the FDA has a patent on us. You cannot talk. The FDA talk, you shut up. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to find out. <laughs> so, the judge said, what perspective is yours? <coughs> Dr. Victor Herbert, Dr. Bonanno, and Dr. Christopher said, how could there be another? I said, there is another, Your Honor. And what is the other? The African bioelectric cell food. I've never heard of such a thing. That's what the physician said. He had never heard of the African bioelectric cell food. I said, of course. But we have to remind the good physician that he have not heard of a whole lot of other things. <laughs> but that doesn't deny the existence of the African biomineral electric cell food. What is it? The, okay. The allopathic claim that there are multiple disease. The African biomineral balance negate that position. There's only one. 
disease. Never been to. The allopathic claim that to treat the multiple disease, you must use a chemical, which is violating God. Right? The African bowel balance said no. It's a nutritional approach, electric food. Your Honor, I told you that this man was insane and unscientific. He said there's only one disease, but there's only one. Remember, I'm the boy that didn't go to school. I'm going to break things down to the least common denominator. When I was a steam engineer, I found out that in a machine, thermodynamics I'm talking about, or an automobile, the only thing that could cause this machine to go bad is what? Short circuit, obstruction, overheating, the same thing with the human body. So what did I do? I put compounds together that would cleanse the human body of what? of mucus. In so doing, AIDS, sickle cell, lupus, herpes, blindness. But it sounds too simple, right? But that's not my fault. They have complex things and then they deal with the complexity. And boy, that's a job. But with us, on our journey from Africa to America, it was easy because the slave master had a ship and brought us over. But getting back to Africa, we get confounded. We can't go back now. We don't know how to go back. We better not even go back. Because when I tried to, to go back, this is what I did. My first trip with a passport was to Kenya. So I went to Kenya and they said, where, where your passport? I said, I have no passport. I said, I was taken away 500 years ago, I'm back. <laughs> when I left, I didn't have any passport. <laughs> so why are you asking me for a passport now? Is, is a passport African? Put it one side. They put me one side and sent me back out. But you think that was bad? That was a bad way. May, may I have that? I go to Africa. I go with my wife, and I say, well, boy, I'm happy. Girl, we're going to liberate Africa. We're going to do something for mother country. Ah. I go and I saw Dr. Parinyatwa in Zimbabwe. I said, Dr. Panyatwa, I think your problems are over with. Not only Zimbabwe, all of Africa. Here is Hospital Vicente Di Antoni, is an Italian hospital. Department of Blood and Laboratories. Oswald Savala, HIV positive, on the 25th of November of 1993. 17th of January of 1994, HIV negative. This boy named Alfredo Lagos, this from the Red Cross, the Honduranian Red Cross. It says here that this boy, it doesn't show any date of which he contacted AIDS. Why? Because he was born with AIDS. But down here it says he's negative on the 19th day of January of 1995. Another one. This one caused a laboratory to call for me. I thought it was funny. This is the next one, the other one. His name is Alex Suarez. On the second day of January, this boy of August, I'm sorry, he found himself with HIV positive. On the 19th day of August of the same year, 17 days later, the boy is no longer HIV positive. So they called me. For what? I don't know. Because I know they're not going to change it. Now, this one you're going to like. This one is from the San Diego Public Health Laboratories. 
It says here that this man has a R HIV-1 RNA 26,205. The boy was supposed to be dead at 25, right? Just go to the other page. Six months later, he's less than 400. He was killed at 15. So anybody want to read it? Because I could be lying, because that's the way we think. But here it is. <laughs> no, that's possible. I could be lying. Here, young lady. So, killing AIDS, brother and sister, look, that's the easiest thing for niggas to do. <laughs> we could do more than that. Curing AIDS, to them is big thing. To us, it's nothing. You understand? But now, here is where, here is where this little carpet comes in. Where did I put it? The blood, no, nope, no good. Here it is. Blood and starch. Blood and starch. Blood and starch is going to prevent you from doing what the ants does for each other. Ants, when it's getting ready to rain, you know what they do? All the black ants, they begin to do what? Cut the leaves and take them to their little nests. Ants doesn't eat leaves. They eat the mycelia that grows on the leaves with the temperature. They are farmers, but they provide when it rains. Red ants does the same. But we black people, we can't do that. Because when your brother showed the world that he cured AIDS, why didn't the African countries jump on it? All the African people eat is blood and starch, nothing else. But that is the Africa that you and I dream about. The Africa that we want to save. The Africa that we all love. I found out that there is no president in Africa that is interested in the cure for AIDS. Not one. No, I'm sorry. Only one. I'm not going to name the country because I may jeopardize the country. Because the one thing I learned that when you begin to talk favorable about a country or an individual, they're going to soon get him. That is a fact. So I cannot talk about the country that said to Dr. Sebi, Dr. Sebi, whenever you want to return to Africa and begin this new empire, you have 5,000 acres of land and six hot springs. I don't need anything else. Hot springs? Five hot springs with 5,000 acres of land? We could grow food. We could make the best dress. I said, sir, I am not going to come to your country unless I'm able to grow marijuana. He said, marijuana? <laughs> he said, wait just a minute. He said, I can't do that. I said, well, the compounds I've been giving your nephew that had, that was autistic, that now is talking was marijuana. And as for you is concerned, when I came here, you weren't walking. You were dying. Now you're running up the steps in the presidency. Yes, marijuana. That's a God's product. That's not cigarettes. You see what happened? My brother used to smoke cigarettes, but my brother didn't know that the tobacco that he was smoking was artificial. God didn't make that. But marijuana, God did make that. So it must have been a good reason why I was told in school that everything God made is good? Well, I know that. I live that. And I always will smoke it for as long as I live. Why? Because I have that right. I have that right. It's not everybody that uses it from autism to arthritis. It's cured because everything that God made is good. So as I go to Africa, all happy, <laughs> I came back with my tail between my legs because it ain't happening. It ain't going to happen. They're not interested in that. 
But the one thing I noticed today and yesterday, and you may have heard it, President Clinton and Sanjay Gupta, they found the end of AIDS. How could they find the end of AIDS when they have not found the end of diabetes, the end for sickle cell, the end for any disease? But they're going to tell us that they're going to bypass these lesser diseases and jump on the major one, and they've got the cure for it. I got documents to substantiate that I cure AIDS, right? So what's up? What's up? Well, I'm going to show you what's up. When I was in Zimbabwe, The, 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 the Department of Health said, why do you come to us saying that you could help us? And your leaders in America didn't help you. My leaders in America? What do you mean by that? <laughs> they mentioned Minister Firecon. I said, just a minute. I don't follow any man. I follow women. And I don't follow sick people. Because if I follow sick people, then i got to be sicker. <laughs> I go to Brazil. They say, why aren't you, if your leaders didn't help you, why should we? I say, my leaders, again, they brought these leaders in front of me. And they mentioned something like Al Sharpton and, and Jesse Jackson. I say, oh, God. <laughs> I say, why you all ask me about these people? I don't never, I never knew of Jesse Jackson or of Shopton or Oprah Winfrey <laughs> promoting something that is equitable and good for the black community. That's never been. Yeah. What they could do is march. That I know. But why do you ask me about it? I'm asking you. Why can't you incorporate this in your, in your repertoire? You said me, I have no leaders. My leader's my mama. The biggest testicles on anybody I've ever seen, they was on my mama. <laughs> So don't ask me about leaders. I don't follow leaders. I never were part of that thinking. I don't need anyone to lead me someplace. So now I'm asking you, what do we do now? I cure AIDS. Are you going to call Oprah? <laughs> you don't need to. She could advertise a million pieces, broken pieces, right? But that's fine. But she cannot advertise the cure for humanity. But there's one little dude that got himself in trouble. And he was totally unaware of what was going to happen. This little dude, I'm home with my wife, enjoying myself. A Sunday afternoon, looking at TV, somebody threw a rock on my window. It's Randy Jackson. Yeah. What did he want? My brother want to see you. Your brother? Michael? <laughs> okay. I went. Well, he's sick as hell. Well, I treated him. And he got cured. He saw it. And he was encouraged to take me to the Rayborn building on Capitol Hill. Oh, my God. This is going to really confound you. Michael Jackson took me to the Rayborn building on Capitol Hill on the 31st day of March. April. April. No, of March. March. It was March. 31st day of March of 204. I said, why are you taking me there? Because you cure AIDS. I said, but what makes you think that they are interested in that? What makes you think that the world is interested. I don't care if it's any country in the world. They are not interested. Especially Africa. They were never interested. AIDS. AIDS isn't killing Africa. Hepatitis C is killing Africa. All of West Africa is the red line for hepatitis C. What you talking about? But they're Muslims. So they have to eat the Muslim food. Which is 
goats and lamb. Go tell them that the Arabs played a trick on their brain. You cannot do that. Me, I remain the son of the jungle woman. The jungle woman that didn't have any clothes on. Yeah, I am her son. I stuck with her and she liberated me. You have to hear this. One morning, I woke up. And I heard the music that was playing. You know how you turn your radio on and you're sleeping? But the music on the radio would influence you. And you dream that you're seeing the artist is playing, right? You have had it happen to you. This morning, I'm listening to John Coltrane. <laughs> Four o'clock in the morning on channel 850 on the TV. I'm sleeping. And I'm hearing John Coltrane playing interstellar space. But then, something was happening while this music was playing. I was looking at a black woman doing this from behind a tree. <laughs> I woke up. And I didn't know how to interpret that dream. But then I was leaving that morning for Los Angeles. As I got to the airport, the governor was there. The governor said, that's him. That's the man that cured Alcida of leukemia. That's the man I'm talking about. The governor had a lot of people around him. So I went, I was leaving for Los Angeles. He was leaving for the capital. He didn't know that we were going to meet that morning. So they was talking to me and asking me questions. Finally, two men that were standing away from me, they were white men from the United States. They came up to me and said, well, we have heard of your miracle cures. I said, sir, I don't even know what a miracle is. It's best to perform one. I just happened to cure leukemia. That's not a miracle. To you, it may be. Because your school of thought have you to believe that curing these diseases is one great big feat. No, it's simple common sense. I'm an African. Now this is where the naked woman is going to come out. They said to me, we have heard of your miracle cures, but have you been saved? You see? <laughs> right there, I consider that an imposition. Why do you take the liberty to believe that I'm one of those that have accepted your philosophy that I have to be saved? I say, from what? <laughs> the man politely answered and said, from your sins, of course. I said, wait just a minute. I said, you know, man, while you guys were standing over there, I said, and I looked at you both, and I said, two very intelligent young men. But now I have to question that. <laughs> he said, why? I said, well, because the color of my skin should have prevented you from asking me that question, have I been saved? He said, what does the color of your skin have to do with anything? I say, it has to do with everything. I am the son of a woman that was taken away from the forest of Africa. She, to begin with, she didn't have any clothes on. But she didn't have any alcohol. And she didn't have any prostitution. And she didn't have any supermarkets. And she didn't have a hospital. And she didn't need anything that God didn't make. And she didn't have any money. So all these things constitute sin. So my mother in the jungles was sinless. How did I become sinful? You cut it out. You stop that. We have to begin to change our diet. Because this diet here of blood and starch is all we eat. That is all we eat. 
And then with this diet of blood and starch, which confounds the hormonal structure, we have the nerve to tell each other's brother, you were wrong. I'm wrong. I mean, where did you get that from? I'm wrong. You, you've been eating blood and starch, and you're going to tell me I'm wrong. No. We've got to stop it. Because the blood and starch is why I couldn't penetrate Africa. So, in, you, you forgot, right? I'm in the Rayborn building. Who is present? Sheila Jackson Lee from Texas, right? John Conyers, Illinois. Of oh, Detroit? Yes, sir. Jesse Jackson Jr. from the House of Appropriation. Our most beloved President Bush. <laughs> no, we have to give him credit. And no African government ever given me the privilege to practice herbology. Bush did. Bush appropriated $5 billion to fight AIDS in Africa, right? And the African government didn't appropriate one dime. They didn't want their brother to do it for free. So Bush, Bush stands out way above there. Bush gave $5 billion and Jesse Jackson Jr. is there. So when I go to the podium and I say, fellas, you all don't have to look for the cure of AIDS anymore. Here it is. Jesse Jackson Jr. did this. <laughs> I said, I'm going to talk about this. I have to write about this in my book. Because you, not me, but you and I believe in the leaders. We hope that they could do something, right? Well, they had a chance. So, 17 African ambassadors. Only one came to me from Mali. The only man came to me and said, Dr. Sebi, I, uh, I have to respect your position. And I appreciate your position. You have proven that you cure AIDS, and I would like for you to go to Mali. But that's not the country I was talking about previously. He just presented himself that day. But Jesse Jackson Jr. didn't tell you that I cure AIDS, right? He didn't tell his daddy either, isn't it? And Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee didn't talk about it, right? And so did John Conyers. So who gives a damn? You see? But that's good. That's good. We don't need leaders, isn't it? So we're going to do it. Because we're doing it now. Because those black women I'm talking about, there's one sitting there. They are going to tell the world we could AIDS. But last night, Clinton and Sanjay Gupta <laughs> is on CNN talking about the end of AIDS. How about the end of sickle cell? How about the end of lupus? How about the end of herpes? How about the end of blindness? They, don't, they, they didn't find those, but they find the end of AIDS. How is that possible? Are we going to buy that too? Are we going to let them continue to say that there is no cure for AIDS when your brother is curing it? So we are guilty. We are the ones that are guilty, not the leaders, because they're sick. All the leaders are sick. You can look at them and tell they're sick. So we have to forget about the leaders, right? So which animal in the forest follows a male? None, right? They all follow females. So how did we begin to follow males? <laughs> I mean, that, that was the most, look, the one thing I wanted in my life was a woman laying by me as my significant other or my wife that she didn't have a god or a devil in her brain that woman is sitting there because I could not have a woman laying by me and she worshiping something else I mean nothing to her no you worship you that's who you worship that's who we worship in the forest and we were doing quite well because none of us her children could talk about how long did our parents live in the forest of Africa? 
You don't know. For millions of years since creation, did we have money? We live a perpetual vacation. <laughs> now I gotta wear this stupid suit on. <laughs> when I didn't have to wear any clothes. But now just to live, I have to have a $15,000 suit on, a $5,000 shoes, I have to have all kind of stuff on me. And then I qualify. I qualify. Do you have a master's degree? Man, I didn't go to school. Oh, put him aside. <laughs> So in essence, there's no one on this planet that is interested in the cure for any disease. None of the leaders, none of those who are talking, they are not interested. It was simple. It was understanding that is alkalinity that cures, not acidity. And any healer that comes to you with these things like adding carrots like marimba it says here one of the things that I are careful with it says here if you add carrot juice with it it's going to help you but just a minute carrot was made by some dude in Holland it's very acid so this moringa knows that you have both eye closed so I could sell you anything. We don't want that anymore. We don't want to tell stories anymore. We don't want to protect the stories anymore. But you see what happened? When you have been healing or call yourself a healer for 20 or 30 years using comfrey and rose hips and recommending tofu and someone come on the set and says that you may not be quite right, man, you get off there. You begin to get crazy. You begin to go crazy on that person because you have invested 30 years and people know you and now you can't turn back and say, I was wrong. Well, I was wrong. And it was one little lady, 94 years of age, named Mrs. Holloman. I was along with the rest of the healers. I was reading these books by Jethro Kloss, Alma Hutchins, Indian Herbology of North America, Myers, Christopher, also this other named Shooks. And they all have calcium in it, so I had to believe that, right? And I went to Mrs. Holloman, I said, Mrs. Holloman, you gotta drink carrot juice. She said, sit down, boy. I think you're crazy. I think you're out of your mind. I'm 94 years of age. I don't wear glasses. I don't need you to come and tell me to drink carrot juice because I know that carrot is a poison. I was in Rattan, the island of Rattan, and a woman was listening to me talk, and she asked me, what is the best breakfast in the morning? I said, I don't know. She said, a glass of hot water. I know she was right. The system was right. So in essence, all of the hoopla about AIDS was just noise. We've been curing AIDS since 1984. Why didn't you know about it? The media didn't let you hear it, right? right. Jesse Jackson Jr. didn't talk to, about it, right? Well, I think in the book I have to mention his name because this is what's happening. They're lying to us. And we have to stop it. We have the cure for every disease in the world. We, the black race, is responsible. Not the white, not the Chinese, not the Arab. The Arab need help. They need help now. All Arabs need help. Because there's no way in the world where you find the highest incidence of eye problem like Arabia. Because they eat lamb. But could you go and turn Arab to stop eating his lamb? It's like going to tell someone that uses cocaine, stop. Then you're crazy. Like going to Africa and tell a Maasai, hey Maasai, you only live 47 years, man, and you're going to die because you're eating raw blood and starch. He won't chop your head off. And he should. Then we go to Guinea, 
And my wife came to me running. She said, the young man in there with his wife, he's 19. And she's complaining he's impotent. At 19, she said, yes. My wife came with it. What happened? We asked the boy, what does he eat? He eats cassava. Cassava? We say raw? Yes. Go to Guinea. He's is a what? Uh, cassava. I want you to go to any African country and tell them. No, just ask them, please. Why do you eat cassava? Oh, this is African. This is from history. Hey, African. I know you've been bamboozled too. <laughs> because cassava is not a product of nature, nor of Africa. Cassava is a starch that needs the aid of a man to grow it. Cassava cannot grow by itself. And it has cyanide. But the cyanide has already affected the brain. He cannot think for himself. It's like that, talking to a Haitian or a Brazilian. Ah, in fact, the only country that I have ever visited that have people dark like me, but nobody in Brazil is black. Brazil. <laughs> if you go and research the census of Brazil, you will never find a black person in Brazil. Everybody is white. That is how much they have offended us. That we hate the very image that God made. Something is wrong. Something got to be wrong. Me? I was a very good Christian. And a very good Muslim. A very good Buddha. And I wanted to join the... <laughs> well, I don't want to mention it. But anyway, I was a good everything. But what I found, that they were feeding me the wrong food. And I had to deny all of them. Because they feed us garbage. There isn't a religion in the world that have fed the black race in America. Or anywhere in the world, the food that is consistent with their cellular predisposition. So if you, my religion, is feeding me the wrong food, then what is the message you are sending? It's like putting gasoline in a diesel car. You would not get to South Philly. <laughs> no, you're not. You're not going to run right. But we're eating starch and blood, and we want a dialogue. Dialogue based on what? I mean, come on, huh? We are the remnants of what world. Let us try to bring it back. We can't challenge each other. The only thing we have to offer each other now is love. But to get to that point, a sister told me the other day, because I made a statement in the church, a brave woman stood up and asked me, Dr. Sebi, uh, <coughs> what have you learned from the entity that you are affording to us now. What have you learned from it? I learned to kiss everybody's butt. And I meant that. It came out that way in the church. Well, I had to give it that way. Because that is the way it came to my brain. I kiss everybody's butt. It's easy. You see, it makes it easy. When you start kicking it, Somebody going to do something to you. <laughs> and when you start kissing it, they reward you. So this sister came to me, and she was very smart. She said, do you literally? I said, drop your panties. <laughs> well, I came out of a woman's vagina. I could kiss her rear end. That's easy, isn't it? Is it easy? 
<laughs> See, I have no what you are called shame. I don't know what that is. I'm not serious. I'm not shame. I'm not a man. I'm a male. Beyond that, I don't know. You guys are men. I'm, I'm a male. I stay there. It's easy. So, brothers and sisters, look. The deal is this. We have the cure for AIDS. Now you're going to get a chance to ask questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to ask whatever question comes to your brain. Feel free to ask. I mean, please, don't you hesitate. Don't you feel that you have to restrict yourself. I know Brother this is here. He may ask a few. I'm glad to see the brother, you know. Brother this is a brother I've been knowing for years. Stand up, brother. And when I saw the brother the other day, I was very encouraged because the brother looks good. Yes, sir. I appreciate the brother. The brother looks good. The brother, I remember him and Sultan and Quick, uh, Kwasi in New York. I would hope that Kwasi would come. And a bunch of other brothers. It was a bunch of us brothers. We were in love. New, New York, New York was, look, we were in love. Of there was a love that we used to share that was so nice, so warm. But none of us, or all of us understood that we couldn't follow anybody. Because if you start following one, you have to dislike the other group. But I'm a black man. I have to love everybody. I have to love Muslims. I have to love Buddhists. I have to love Christians. So if I have to love everybody, then I'm going to make it easy. I enjoy nobody. Because I have to love everybody anyway. So it makes it easy. So now we go to the question. The sister and then you, another, yes. Good afternoon. Is it necessary to circumcise the male child? Again, sit down. The sister asked, <laughs> is it necessary to circumcise the boy, the male child? Well, who started that? European. European. Who, my last little girl was born, I said, you're not... I told the mother, if this child is born and I'm not here, you will not cut the navel string, okay? You understand? Listen to me now, Fanny. You will not cut this baby navel string. Okay. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. When the baby's born, you put the baby on your chest and let the baby suck your breast. The placenta is going to come right out. You put the placenta in a bowl and put some flowers on it. Keep the navel string attached to the baby until the placenta Four days later, it falls off the baby, you throw away everything. No cutting, no stress. No, it is necessary to circumcise. Because I was never circumcised. Circumcised. It was you. Next. I've been seen by you before, and I was very successful with it. But I'm a backslider, and I want to know, what is the cure for AIDS so I can get back on track? Uh, she said that she, I treated her before, and that she was cured. But something happened, I don't know, she, she wanted to get back on track. And, what, and the next question about how do I cure AIDS? Well, many, many, my, I have a daughter now that's 21, and she's the key to beautiful things. She's the daughter of this woman. Her mother hated me. And with all rights, the, the woman was right, oh God, she was right. I had two wives in the same house, and this woman is in love with me. Oh, God, this nigga is crazy. He's a Solomon. Nigga, look, you are a jive MF. Her mother cursed me out. She cursed me out, and I'm standing looking at Miss Margaret, and I could see the hurt in her eyes because this woman is in love with this man that already have two wives in the same house. <coughs> Boy, what do I do? And I find myself in this triangle here and don't know how I got in it. But years went by. No, she got a baby. She got pregnant. They kicked her out of the house. But that's okay. She had the baby, little girl, Zave. Zave grew up. Zave was 19. She cured her mother, her grandmother of diabetes. The little girl that this woman didn't want to come into the world grew up to cure her of diabetes. Last month, I got a notice 
from the mother that Zave just killed a woman in New York of AIDS. How do we kill AIDS? It's simple. We put the compounds together to address the mucous membrane, to cleanse the mucous membrane, to cleanse the bowels. Simultaneously, we went to the forest and found the herbs such as the over here on the alkali side, 